everybody deserves to eat the best food that is available. If we're just going to, you know, eat packaged, processed, frozen foods all the time, then we're just setting ourselves up for some type of malady in your body. There was an article about eight years ago, and it says, do you want to fix America? Fix its food. Not just in the States, I think worldwide, we are actually growing considerably more food than it would take to feed everyone in the world and feed everyone well. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, production needs to increase by 60% to keep up with the growing population. Well, first and foremost, I really think it's a privilege to be able to do this. Um, I am able to, although I, I work part-time at like two different jobs, contributing to more than a full work week, but I have the flexibility within certain days of the week to come and take care of my garden. Um, a lot of people don't have that. And there's families, oftentimes in urban areas, that uh, have to work multiple jobs uh, just to bring, just put food on the table ad, as it is. And this is like food that doesn't require your time. Like uh, it just requires like from A to B. But if you, time is an investment as well as like both monetarily and of yourself. And so I think that in order to uh, create an urban garden situation where it's community based, you those kind of conversations need to be had as well. This is a map of urban gardens across the United States based on the research conducted by growing cities. This is a map depicting the state of food insecurity across the United States, according to Gallup. This means certain communities lack access to food that is necessary for a nutritious diet. The United States' food insecurity has diminished over the years. However, the habits of the public hasn't changed enough. At every, not every other corner, there was a liquor store. And as an alternative to a grocery store, there are only these liquor stores available. And what are you going to do? You're going to go for convenience. And those are what contribute to, I feel, food deserts in that you're not able to find places where you can find, where there's uh, green vegetables, or, um, or ripe fruit and such. Uh, so an urban garden really, I think, does foster that, uh, that ability to provide for the community. Sun Cafe started nine years ago. Uh, I have been a veggie vegan for 42 years, and I was a chef earning my way through college. Uh, and one night I had 50 pieces of meat on the grill, just like any other night, and the blood was pouring out and the grease was in my face like every other night. But something happened one night and the light bulb went on and I decided that wasn't food anymore. Most of the large land mammals in the world eat leafy greens all day long. There's exceptions, certainly the you know cat family and so on, but horses, elephants, giraffes, rhinos, hippos, gorillas, that's what they concentrate on. They're eating mostly leafy greens, and there's lots of evidence to show that humans are meant to eat lots of leafy greens too. According to the Agricultural Research Service, the population as a whole is not eating enough fruit, veggies, grains, or dairies, but instead we are eating as much as 70% above the goal for added sugars, 71% above the goal for saturated fats, and 89% above the goal for sodium. Pollinate Farm and Garden is a store in Oakland, California. 
and it is designed to support people who want to grow more of their own food, whether they are in a small space or they share a space with other folks or if they farm on the edge of town, um, community groups, schools, or just within a family. We've been here five years now and it's so great to see families grow and change. I've seen couples get together, I've seen couples break up, I've seen customers who were really happily part of a family and then their, their significant other pass away. And so I just kind of, sitting here in this hub, I see the whole cycle of life happen um, and people keep returning and it's all around food and growing food and, and raising their animals for food. And it's just a, an amazing thing. I love that. I love to see the families grow and change. One of the great events that we have here in the summertime, it's called a crop swap. And so folks will grow food. And of course, you know, when you're excited in the spring, you grow way more typically that, than you can eat. So people will bring their extra produce here. So if you've got too many green beans, you can swap it for corn. Or if you've got too many tomatoes, you can swap it for zucchini. Um, and so it's people from all walks of life, all different cultures, and they start talking about how they prepare the same veggies. So, you know, they'll, they'll have different recipes and they'll swap and it's, it's really a great thing to see. People will bring their children um, and it's a lot of fun. I spent about 25 years as a coder and technology person and then had an epiphany and decided to go into teaching. So I taught fifth grade for a while doing that and then I took a job as a science teacher at a local school and got very involved. I was responsible for the school garden and um, the science program for 550 kids K-6. Gradually I turned the front garden into an orchard with a um, pollinator habitat underneath. It's a registered Monarch Way station. Um, last year I raised and released 180 monarch butterflies out of the front garden. And I also raised gold fritillaries and swallowtails and now we have a project going where we're bringing back a um, high fine swallowtail into the area by bringing back the plant. So we're really excited about that project. There are a lot of people working on it here in Oakland. You know, every time I was out in the garden with students, they were so engaged. So many of the kids who have a hard time in the classroom just love being out there digging. They don't have an opportunity to do it very much, at least not in this community. They're scheduled there at soccer practice and this practice and that practice, but nothing where they get to actually just play in the dirt and with the water. I mean, the, their favorite day was the day they dug up and put the compost into the soil. You know, we had one really awful circumstance, but um, it turned out to be interesting in the long run, is that um, we were raising caterpillars in the classroom. I had run out of the plant that we needed for them in the garden. And so I ran to the nursery, and it was a very reputable organic e-nursery, and got plants. And they were in the second grade classroom, and very quickly the caterpillars just withered and died off the plants. And we came to find out that there's an, a pesticide, it's not a chemical one, it's a biological pesticide, that nurseries, no matter what, have to spray if a certain pest is seen in the nursery. They have traps. and um, So they don't know if a given plant has been sprayed because they just occasionally have to spray whatever's currently in stock. Um, and it's not considered toxic, but it is toxic to caterpillars. And so, you know, you can imagine second graders watching their caterpillars wither and die. This became a big deal. So, you know, we talked to the nursery, we found out what would happen. They were very apologetic, but they explained that there, there was nothing they could do about it. Um, but the kids were, you know, really up in arms about it. So it was an opportunity for them to write letters and, you know, Sit, let their feelings be known and, you know, getting second graders to write letters that have 
a political impact. I mean, that's the kind of thing we want to see them feeling like they can do. This is the first rooftop garden in Western America. And uh, we started six years ago. And started with just a couple towers, added a few more, and then when the company final, finally settled in and said, well, yes, we're going to be producing and uh, selling these towers to the public, we became one of the first little small commercial farms. So basically you have a reservoir of water which you add your nutrients to, and, and that is pumped by a very small pump up through a central column into a shower cap at the top and it just drips down through a series of holes over the openings and there's, uh, it's a modular system so that you can go as high as you want and each grow pot has four ports in it uh, around the circumference and then there's another four and another four and so the roots are just hanging on the inside clinging to the surface and they're having the um, nutrients and water brought to them rather than sitting in nutrients like hydroponics and the advantage is that they have maximum oxygen. So um, there's t a typical tower for someone at home would be 28 ports and uh, if you just grew lettuce you can probably once you've got the seed started to a little seedling and put it in the tower uh, it takes care of itself. You could take a two-week holiday you don't have to do much ideally started plants at different times, you would probably be able to have at least one head of lettuce a day off your tower. 28 heads would grow in about three weeks. We're so out of effect to the lobbies of the big industries, the dairy industry, the meat industry, there is no carrot lobby. There's nobody trying to get you to eat more carrots, but there's all sorts of people trying to slide cheese into everything and meat into everything, and, and we're suffering as a consequence. I'm not saying you, you have to be a vegan, but if you just curtail it a bit, perhaps have two or three smaller portions of animal protein during the week and fill the rest up with healthy vegetables. The food culture, basically, the culture around you know how you eat and what you eat and what you waste and what's considered waste and so on. It's I guess initially it was a bit of a shock, and then later on it became kind of a more of a political thing that this is actually at the systemic level something we're definitely doing wrong. The biggest point, once again, it always comes back to this: that you know, is food a commodity or is it? something everyone should have access to and we have access to it and we also have some additional meal means like you know some land available to us and some time and organizational skills and so on so we're gonna use all of these to basically address what we see as, as the social injustice that you know that there are these people who don't have access to you know one of the basic needs. We got chickens and a couple of roosters. Well, this is Grow Good. Um, we're a nonprofit farm that was uh, started in 2011 and is about an acre and a half big. And we supply uh, produce to a shelter kitchen across the street. I have been a journalist for a whole career. I decided maybe it was time sort of my last chance maybe to try something new. So I decided to leave. I was at the Los Angeles Times. I decided to leave. Not quite certain what I was gonna do yet, but uh, I then saw a notice that they were looking for help here, volunteer help. So I came, I fell in love, and I didn't leave. <laughs> and um, eventually I got hired as a part-time farmhand, and um, now I'm the executive director of the nonprofit. We have plenty of places where it's not easy to get good food. You know, food desert has been the term of use a lot, and, but I think it's switching a little bit. And I hear more and more people talking about um, 
food apartheid neighborhoods because the difference is that a desert is sort of a natural happening, right? And that these, these neighborhoods are not by nature lacking in good food. It was something that was done by you know, businesses or whatever. There, there are plenty of neighborhoods where it's fast food or the gas station. What we're doing to combat that, I think, is we exist across the street from a very large homeless shelter. 500 people live there, and um, a lot of those people have been on the streets for, you know, many, actually, I know someone who spent the last 30 years on the street, right, who lives there at the shelter now. Obviously, it's really difficult to get delicious, fresh food if you're living on the streets. Our primary goal for this year and however long it takes is to get our greenhouse. We have, we've just built this commercial sized greenhouse to get it up and fully running to get irrigation electricity in and to develop a sort of going social enterprise project so that we can, that we'll have like two ideas, one of which is to provide a steady stream of income for us and also enable us to um, give people jobs from the shelter that will enable them to when they are independent and leave the shelter to actually use the experience to get a regular job full-time permanent job We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we survive off of grants and donations. We provide food for the neighborhood, the food desert neighborhoods in War 7 and 8. We give away free vegetables to the neighborhood. We have a market. We do a CSA and we work with a couple schools where we provide them with f free f vegetables and they come out and we had little classes with them and show them things around the farm. I never have had to work at being a food activist because of the simple fact I am a free-hearted person. If, if, if I'm eating some good, I would like for you to eat some good too. And that's the way I've been all my life. I got that from my parents, you know. They used to have a, a big garden and when it was more than we needed, we also gave it to the neighbors. So. It was just in me to do it. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been working here now for four years. And you know, I've had some scrape with illnesses and I go in, go to the hospital, get well, come back. And, and that's been going on for about all four years. You know, I, I get down sometime, but I get back up. A positive moment was me going from 318 pounds down to 205. Because first of all, I think I changed my way of eating a lot. And then it, it made me get plenty of exercise. My husband is just the opposite. And I, I know he's gonna pay for it later. And, and I feel like he's paying for it now. But to Boris, when he was a child, if I put some on your plate, you better eat it. And my mom always had a garden, so it's kind of, I almost knew what to do. Our food is totally organic. We use no pesticides, no nothing. But we can't call it organic. We like, at our stand, we can't say, come get your organic vegetables. They gotta be just vegetables. Because the, in order for your stuff to be organic, you have to send it out somewhere to pay for it to get done to put them to put a stamp on it, and then they send it back. And I feel as though the stuff that they tell you organic in the store might not be organic. <laughs> you know, how did they get it so pretty without putting anything on it? And how could it go that far and come back and still be fresh? You know, it's kind of a question when the vegetables here just last so long. If it's organic, it might got a hole in the leaf from a bug eating on it or, or something of that nature. You know, uh, non-organic non foods, it's like a mind game. It is almost tricky because it looks so good. If I see something like that, then I know 
Okay, they didn't put no whole bunch of pesticides on this stuff. It's been positive for me because I eat better now. I, and I enjoy vegetables more than I used to. Um, and gardening is like so laced to me. Like I get to kind of free my mind and relax and kind of put my focus on the vegetables and gardening, kind of relieve a little stress sometimes. Yeah, green space in urban areas is something that's really um, been studied and continues to be studied for lots of benefits. Uh, in fact, I was recently just saw a uh, research project going on in Great Britain where they talked about uh, they've taken aerial photographs of different communities and neighborhoods and they were based on uh, their density and their economics and demographics and then they compared that to uh, mental health issues that have happened in those and they found a correlation so the areas that had more green space where people had more access to being the, to nature and being out of doors there seemed to be uh, less instances of mental health uh, issues. So that's one study. Uh, there's also studies that say uh, you know, having access to green space in urban areas helps reduce crime. There's studies on academic campuses uh, that show that students perform better in a campus that has lots of trees. We have 3,500 trees, so hopefully our students are benefiting from all that and uh, doing better. So, a lot, you know, we, we feel that we hear from a lot of our pers prospective students that are looking to come here that they're looking for a campus that is uh, green and sustainable. And AU, American University, is one of the more sustainable campuses in the country. We, in fact, we are the only university uh, that is now 100% carbon neutral as of just a couple months ago. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, so being carbon neutral means basically that we, um, all the energy that we use, we either offset or reduce or eliminate in some cases. So we're at net zero, which is somewhat, in, you know, you think that's a big challenge, which it is. Uh, but certainly the first way is to try to reduce the energy you're using. But as a university, obviously you can't cut that to zero. So um, we do other things like um, buy some offsets and have some projects uh, really around the world that help do that. Um, one of the other things that we do is we have a big solar farm down in North Carolina, which is interesting because it's uh, land's cheaper in North Carolina and there aren't big open spaces here in the city, but uh, that part of North Carolina is actually on our power grid. So the energy we're producing down there comes into the big pool of energy that we draw from. So that's kind of neat. And that takes up about 50% of our energy use. But the next thing to do, or I think we're going to be able to do it here in a year or two, is uh, remove all the asphalt paving. So it used to be a lot of roadways, a lot of parking up there. We were a commuter school for many, many years. I'm talking back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but the, the remnants of those old roadways are still around. So if we could uh, eliminate those and turn it into something more sustainable, like permeable paving, for example, maybe make it uh, more attractive, more functional from a sustainability standpoint, and uh, more pedestrian feeling as opposed to vehicular feeling. I think that will really be kind of like the cherry on top, so to speak, of our, our campus quad and really go a long ways. So we have four core programs, our trainings and professional developments with educators throughout DC, our um, early childhood program, it's called our early growers program, and that's relatively new, it's just starting up this, this uh, spring. Our high school program, which is our youth entrepreneurship cooperative. We also have um, school gardens that we help maintain uh, throughout the year by providing professional development with the educators, as I mentioned. We really try to create an environment where everybody's welcome, everybody's input matters, and everybody is contributing back into the space. Our high school program is geared towards providing um, entrepreneurial skills for students who may not get that experience within their high schools. Um, as well as a space for them to be able to talk about things such as food justice, uh, living here in a food desert, D.C. For people who are living in cities, you learn a lot through just trial and error. Um, in my first year being here, I've started growing a uh, windowsill garden. 
So even just the smallest amount of space that you have, you can make it green and you can make it, uh, you can activate that space and you can make it uh, serve you as well as whoever's in your community. We actually were looking for a small farm, just a tiny little 10 acre thing for me to, I was like, oh, I had a horse as a kid, I want to have a horse again. But what we ended up with was a very large farm that needed a lot of work. So now I have all these animals, we raise all of these herbs, and I do not have a single horse anywhere on the farm. We uh, leased out our land to somebody who could just have animals on it for a little bit. I observed what he was doing. I learned the things that I didn't like that he was doing. I observed some of the things that were happening to the land that I didn't think were the best practices. We used to raise meat chickens. I couldn't make any money with meat chickens. It has a lot to do with the USDA processing rules and the processors available to me to USDA process my chicken to make them legal to sell. Um, I just ended up losing money, and so I had to let go of that. And I have a lot of customers that are disappointed I don't sell chicken, but if I can't make money at it, and even worse, in business, if you lose money on a product, every time you sell that product, you're actually paying somebody your own money to take it from you, which um, that was a realization that's a big light bulb about just business and agriculture in general. Some restaurants and some other people, sometimes they, they love to local wash their products. They will buy something from a farmer once a year, once a month, and then they'll put them on the menu at the restaurant to make themselves look good, but they're really not economically supporting the farmer. And you know, if somebody puts my eggs on their menu and they're not serving my eggs, when that customer eats that egg, they're like, ah, oh, her eggs are nothing special. Because they actually just use somebody else's, which um, that kind of thing really bothers me. I have noticed that more people are, for example, digging up their front lawns and instead of grass they're planting flowers or planting perennials and things like that. So years ago when I first got my plot here, it, the community gardens in the city were not really managed by the city. They sort of were there and it was kind of an ad hoc individual thing. There was no coordinated effort to manage the community gardens and several years ago a position was created under the Department of Parks and Rec to manage all the community gardens. Uh, and so they now have uh, a person who is in charge, his name is Josh Singer, and his goal is to increase the number of gardens through the city. The reason why we have bees in our garden is because the city awarded grant money so that community gardens in each ward would have bees. And that is how we came to have our first kind of set of bees in the garden was through a city initiative. California and Washington, D.C. have incredibly different climates, but these examples of organizations shed new light on our agricultural opportunities of the future. The United States as a whole needs to enable new initiatives to assist in the agricultural movement. These deliberate actions would create a collective understanding of our food, nutrition, and the importance of sustainable practices. This would alleviate the physical and mental malnourishment across the United States, and most importantly, the increase of green spaces throughout cities would combat global warming. Thank mm -hmm. you.